let's open in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're just so thankful that we can call you our Father, Lord, that you have adopted us in your family. Lord, that uh, the precious blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, and that because he lives, we may live also. Lord, we look forward to being in that place that he's preparing for us. And we just pray, Lord, help us to be uh, busy about uh, your business, to be available and usable for you, not in the time tonight in the presentation uh, with Ron, and we just pray for the people in Thailand, Lord, for their salvation. We thank you for this time now, in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, four, six, seven. Four stanzas there on the left. Everybody got it? Yep. All right. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope and peace, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. And now, number 807. 807. Eight zero seven. Almost there. All right. Far, far away, in heathen darkness dwelling, millions of souls forever may be lost. Who, who will go? Salvation story telling, looking to Jesus, finding not the cost. Christians awake, your four 
forces all uniting, send forth the gospel, break the chains of sin. All power is given unto me. All power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel, and lo, I am with you always. Why will ye die? The voice of God is calling. Why will you die? Re-echo in his name. Jesus hath died. To save from death appalling, life and salvation therefore go proclaim. All power is given unto me, all power is given unto me. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. salvation shout hallelujah for the Lord is King all power is given unto me all power is given unto me go ye into all the world and preach the gospel and lo the verse is going to be up on the screen here. So, let me get this here. No, it's not. It's going to be on the screen. We don't need any volunteers. So, let me see. You're going to get the light? I'm sure here. Hopefully it wasn't sleeping too long. Let me see. Here. All signal searching and searching. Computer is in Oh, this fell asleep over here. There we go. There it is. Okay. Second Corinthians four six through seven. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency may be, may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 and 7. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 7. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 to 7. One or two more times, you think? Yeah. Yeah. Whose idea was it for two verses? <laughs> Mom, was that you? <laughs> Actually, I had half a dozen verses. Right there. <laughs> I knew we we narrowed it down to two. So. 
All right, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, have shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. Everybody got it? Yeah. All right. So let me go ahead. There's a couple things I wanted to say about that. Okay, go ahead. Uh, first of all, there's a couple things here. That the knowledge of the glory of the God in the face of Jesus Christ. Well, that's kind of a hard way to say that. We wouldn't say that necessarily today. I don't think we'd say it that way. But uh, I got to thinking about it where Jesus was talking about Philip. Philip says, show us the Father. He says, you've seen me, you've seen the Father. There you go. And also, what is that treasure? Think about that. God? What is that treasure? God? Well, yeah, I guess you could say that. Anybody got any ideas? Have you thought about what's that treasure? Jesus? What do we have in this that is that treasure that God has given us? The Holy Spirit. Yeah, just hang on. What? The Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit? Love. Truth? Love. Gospel? Love? Yeah. Bible? All those. <laughs> you got it. King James only and all that good stuff. No. Uh, it's Jesus Christ. Right. Jesus Christ. The Spirit of Christ is abiding in our hearts. And uh, the love of God is so immense, so great. It's, uh, I'm, nowadays I'm concentrating more on 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. The, what the love of God is and what the love of God isn't. And to me, that's, a, that's the, the uh, evidence of the power of the Holy Spirit living out through someone's life. They will live and act like 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Corinthians, I got too many words in my mouth, 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8, and then in the letter 13 it says, now by the faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these of all is love, so praise God for that, thanks for the opportunity to share that, uh, do I have a microphone, do you have a microphone I can use? Uh. Uh, we might be able to plug one in. We're gonna we're gonna try to do this without looking at it now. Okay, great. And then we'll have you start your presentation. No, no, just put up the screen and leave the projector. Okay, one more time. <laughs> okay, one more time. Now. No, I have <laughs> I have a blank thing here to turn to blank it out. All right, one more time then. Second Corinthians four six through seven. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Let me see. 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. Let me see if I can... Yep, there it is. All right, 2 Corinthians 4, 6 through 7. The light to shine out of darkness hath shine in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. For we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. 2 Corinthians 4, 6-7. All right. So we got that. Put this here. And as far as that. I don't know if we have the mic here. Let me see if we can turn this mic on. In the meantime, you will see these in my presentation. This is the Isan New Testament. Uh, this is a miracle the way that this worked out. And this is John Romans in the same thing, only it's a diglot. There's a Isan language on one side and Thai on the other. We printed 34,000 copies of these in 2011. Five years later, June, same month, five years later we printed uh, 10,000 copies of these. Now that won't go very far. The readership in Northeast Thailand is 28 million people plus. 
just in Northeast Thailand. One third of Thailand's total population and land mass never before had the word of God in their own language. And each of these, both of these, as a, in the foreword, has this little uh, creation evangelism book that, that uh, I came up with. And you'll see that on there too. So if anybody wants to look at them afterwards, you're free. You can take it home if you can read it. <laughs> I don't think anybody be taking it home. <laughs> Can I have some water? Yeah, Anybody got, got yeah. access to water? Yeah, try, the yeah, try one of the buttons to, on the, right to the left or the right of that one. Try the right one. So it, so it lights. Yeah. Okay, try the left one. There you go. Okay, turn the volume up maybe. I don't hear anything here. There it is. Thank you. Hello? Can you hear me all right? Yes. Or do we need to turn the volume up more? No. Okay, Ron, here's the mic for you. Can we have some lights too? Oh, he's going to show it in the dark. Please, yeah, he's oh, going to be doing show the presentation. If you can see it can with see. the lights on up there, that's fine, but it, uh, it might be easier to see turn with the, the lights off. Top, anyway. Yeah, turn the front ones off. Yeah, just the front. The back ones on. Turn it off. Just the front, off, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Oh, that's good. Okay. All right, so let me get the PowerPoint. So when did it all begin? August 26, 1969. Can you hear me? Yes. Is it working? So, today, August 26th, is our 53rd wedding anniversary. Uh, Cheryl is in New York now, Nyack, New York, where her sister lives. And she'll be coming back and we're going to be spending a week up at uh, Newport Beach for a celebration of our wedding. Uh, one week after our honeymoon, we entered New Tribes Mission Training. And you can see there, 50 years later, we got this 50-year plaque, which... Uh, we weren't expecting that. The mission organization I'm with now, they gave us that, Baptist World Missionary Outreach. But we went up there to the uh, New Tribes Mission, which is now called Ethnos 360. Uh, I guess they took the, what we call, they said they took the boot out of the boot camp. It used to be pretty tough training, but now it's pretty mellow. And uh, so, August 26th, 1969. So, a day that will go down in infamy, infamy I guess they say. Uh, oh, Why the changer? This light, I got it. You got it. Just oh, let me okay. know. Okay, uh, when we went into the ministry, uh, there are two different aspects of ministry. It's like we all have the same training necessarily. I'm talking new tribes now. They have one of the best uh, training facilities that there is in any type of a foreign mission outreach. Uh, our emphasis, our goal is to go into all the world, preach the gospel, to reach the unreached, essentially. Uh, to teach, uh, we realize now you just don't go in and say God loves you and Jesus died for your sins. Now some places they may understand that, but in Thailand that just goes right over their heads. And so you have to learn how to present the gospel to them. You don't change the gospel. The gospel never changes. It's your method of delivery that has to change so that they will be able to uh, identify with it, shall we say. Uh, you, then you got linguistics, literacy, translation principles we have to learn, which Cheryl and I both uh, took all that. that we have, essentially, we have our bachelor's in missiology from New Tribes Mission. Uh, and then, of course, the goal is to establish self-sustaining churches. Now, the unique challenges are this. Uh, we have geographical access, procuring supplies and so on. Some people have to hike back in. There's no roads, there's no, it's just dense jungle. Have to go on boats, canoes, planes, helicopter, <coughs> land vehicle. As far as us, we rode in on a motorcycle. Because Northeast Thailand is pretty well developed in many ways, but it was all still very, <clears throat> when we first went into Northeast Thailand, nobody had any electricity except the, the major towns in the, in the provinces. And so we had to learn to read, write, Thai, known language and also unknown languages. I learned two unknown languages, Putai and Nyo. We'll talk about that a little later. 
And then we have to learn the cultural aspects, their own worldview of the secrets of success in missions work is to uh, debug their worldview so you know what they believe. You just don't go in and start preaching the gospel. You have to understand where they're coming from. You have to live with them. Put your Bible aside and just live with them for years and years. Uh, it takes a long time to really get to know people really well. To do any really good translation, you have to know the language, the culture, and that inside and out. Almost so that you will you will you will know the way that they will misunderstand it if you say it in uh, ways that may make super, perfect sense to us. Sense to us. So that's called cracking the worldview, the code of the worldview. How best to present the gospel. Ding. <laughs> Next. Okay, these are some demographics about Thailand. Uh, you see northern Thailand in the green up in the top left, top there, and then northeast, I've color-coded that to the right. A northern Thailand, all of Thailand, that first uh, little white block up in the top left, uh, percent of Christians throughout Thailand, they estimated about 0.75%. Now, I don't know what they're estimating. I uh, this is called uh, up from the Joshua Project, and so they probably would be measuring evangelical Christians. And not all evangelical Christians in Thailand really understand the grace of God either. That's a really big problem. But uh, so we get down to northern Thailand. Northern Thailand is the most reached. A lot of the missionary work started up in there. Uh, there's about almost four percent are Christian in, in northern Thailand, and now we have the big big northern city in Thailand of Chiang Mai, and that's uh, very westernized. Interestingly, a lot of new missionaries that go to Thailand feel the call to Chiang Mai. Uh, <laughs> why did they do that? It's like the pastors that there's a, maybe a church opened up in Honolulu. Do you ever hear about this? Honolulu, Hawaii had a church opening, and many ma many pastors applied for it, saying that they felt it was God who was leading them there. You know? <laughs> and so, uh, going to northern Thailand and Chiang Mai is about the same. It's all it's quite westernized, quite easy to get along. And we got the north northeast area of Thailand. Uh, thirty-four thousand villages. You see, just under the word northeast, thirty-four thousand villages. Thirty-three thousand of them have not been reached. Now, to be reached does not mean they're saved. It refers to having been exposed to the gospel message in some way, shape, or form. 98% of Northeast Thai villages are totally unreached. And there's a village about every three to five kilometers in every which direction. It's just a mass of unreached people, even though the gospel has been in Thailand ever since eight or nine Judson and his wife Anne went over a century or so ago. They was went from Burma over into Thailand. Uh, and so 0.2% of northeastern Thailand, they figure is uh, Christian. Now that would be along with the cities, but the northeastern Thailand that we work with are the, the village people. And I would say there's probably less than 0.1% that are born again Christian. Uh, you see the Mekong River up there on the right. Uh, I just drew that in today. A little shaky there. The Mekong River goes down through, and you see the arrow up there on the right. Uh, that's where we are, right there, right on the river. Uh, Nakampanong, Thailand, is on that, that, right on the edge of the river there. You take a little picture. To the left there, you see, uh, that's a sunrise in northeast Thailand. The river is about a mile wide at that point. So next. Uh, northeast Thailand. Today, there are 28 million people who reside in Northeast Thailand. And these are the type of people we work with. You see the rice farmers on the left-hand side. I've been out on those fields planting rice uh, with them. I've ridden in an ox cart. Now, that's kind of old school now. Now uh, they don't plant rice individually. They sow it like uh, uh, they broadcast it, let's say. And so they modernized a lot of their work, but this is uh, the area where we work. A third of Thailand's total population and land mass are contained in the northeastern region. They call it the Isan region. Their language is more like Lao than it is Thai. So it's never been translated before. Next. One of our challenges is the language. Uh, language acquisition is the key to effective cross-cultural communication. A lot of people go over and think, well, uh, 
I'll just, uh, I'll go start speaking English. I'll find somebody that can uh, translate for me, uh, and I'll just speak in English. Well, that really doesn't work. It really doesn't work at all. Spoken Thai has three components to each syllable. In English or in any non-spoken, uh, non-tonal language, you have two main components to every uh, syllable. You have a vowel and a consonant. But in Thai and all, so we say tonal languages, you have three components. You have a tone of, in syllables, uh, excuse me, in uh, vowels and consonants. And so you can, if you say Thai with the wrong tone, you still have a tone. There has to be a tone there somewhere, whether it's right or wrong or, or whatever, because uh, we have to get that through our heads that every Thai word has a tone. And each syllable has a separate tone. So the writing system is vowels come before, after, above, below, or around the main consonant or consonant cluster. Uh, there are no spaces between words or sentences. 44 consonants. 26 vowels, 10 numerals, you can see the numerals there, nung song, sam si hao, tepet kao sip. Seven tone markers, and there's 87 characters all together in the Thai alphabet. You see a string of them there. In the, I've color coded that. The blue are the high class consonants. Mid is, uh, low, uh, mid, uh, the green is the mid class, and uh, low class are purple. And so you see the way they're split up there. And then to the right of that, that's not color coded, you have the vowels, uh, the vowel uh, representation, shall we, shall we say. Okay, who sells chicken eggs? Kai, 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 kai. Kai, 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 kai. Kai is mid tone, kai is rising tone, kai, low tone, and kai, low tone. Kai, 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 kai. Now, here's a, here's a tongue twister for you. My, 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 <laughs> There's no wood burn, no, do, no, do, no wood does not burn. So how many cows in Thailand? Ah, uh, we have cow, that's the first word there. That's a right, that's a falling tone. The, the initial consonant is a K, and in the middle is the ah, the long ah sound, cow, with a W on the end, cow. That's rice. Now, if I take that little tone marker off the, off the first consonant, like we see in number two there, it becomes a rising tone because it's a high class consonant. It's a high class consonant. It's always rise if they're like that. So that becomes cow. Cow is a color white, not white rice, but just plain white. Now we have a mid tone, cow, which means a kind of a putrid smell, sort of like a fishy smell. Number four, cow, low tone. Uh, five, cow. Okay, cow, in, to enter in cow, rice, of exactly the same uh, sounds, except it's a shorter duration of the bowl. You can see how it's written. I got my little SIG PT20 arrow here. I got to get it out. You see, oh, I'm shaking. Okay, you see, before that, there's a uh, one vowel, and there's another vowel back there, and that makes an owl sound. With the consonant, with the uh, tone marker on top, that makes it a falling tone. Cow. I won't trouble you anymore with that. The next cow is a horn. Another cow, third person pronoun, cow again. Uh, no, that's why. My goodness, look at that. Misspoke. <laughs> you probably picked up on that, I'm sorry. Uh, cow, cow. Cow, now we're changing it a little bit. Cow uh, is number nine. Cow, mid-tone is blue. Cow, to take it to advance or to take a step. Cow, low tone is, uh, uh, means to, is something old. And then cow, mid-tone is to scratch and itch. Cow is an owl and another cow is the main root. So there's 17 of those just out of cow. Next. Got a whole herd. Huh? No bull here. Yeah. <laughs> no bull, no bull. <laughs> no. Uh, okay, Buddhism. Buddhism this is a Buddhist year 2565. Uh, it's uh, 543 years uh, oh, more than uh, our. If you take that and, and you subtract 450. 
four, excuse me, 543, you'll come up with our year, uh, 2022. Uh, Buddha is not their god, by the way. He was a, a prince out of northern India, and he saw the sin and suffering and sorrow and degradation, and it really bothered him. He, saw, he went on a quest to try to figure out why this all occurred, and he, become, he came up with the idea, he realized that it was lust and unrequited desires. Now you look at 1 Peter 1, 4, and uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 14, and then it says the same thing. This world is corrupt through lust. The only thing is, in his meditation, he didn't see God. He just saw the fact that uh, there was a way to try to alleviate that, and what that was, he came up with uh, an eightfold middle path. And that was ways to do good, practice good, right thinking, right actions, right uh, thought life, eight of those all together. And so Buddha came up with a good set of rules. Now he came out of Hinduism where they believe in reincarnation. And so to be saved in a Buddhist culture means to uh, become good enough after multiple reincarnations to finally spin off and go to nirvana. Now, nirvana is not heaven. Nirvana is poof. You're not there anymore. There's nothing left to reincarnate back into this world with all that sin and suffering and dying and so on. So to a Buddha, nirvana is salvation, which means you cease to exist. Now, doesn't that sound like something you'd like to explore? Well, 80% of the Thai Christians, it, they were, uh, there was a... Uh, Survey down. 80% of the Christians said the reason they can't be were interested in coming to God is because of the love of God. Love, God had love for them, and He He made it possible for them to go to heaven. And so then another part of Thai uh, religious life was Brahmanism. This is uh, from the uh, from the uh, Hindu caste. Uh, they believe in magical incantations, spells, wearing of charms and amulets. And some of these charms and amulets are actually little mini. Uh, Buddha images and so on, and then you have animism, uh, the appeasement of malevolent uh, evil spirits, let's put it that way. Fallen angels, of course, is what they are, uh, and so they try to feed these evil spirits. Sometimes it's the spirit of an ancestor that uh, didn't have enough uh, merit to go on and be reincarnated again. And so this is the threefold aspect of high religious life. And then, of course, you have all the taboos and folklore and superstitions and all that thing all mixed in together. Next. So, this was our phase one of our ministry. Right in the middle of the top, just under the word, the word village, you see the house that I built in this village. Uh, no electricity. I use a handsaw, hammer, chisel, uh, <laughs> all hand tools. And it's uh, 26 feet wide and 24 feet deep, 36 wide, 24 deep, with three bedrooms. You got a bathroom, there's a, a well in the, there's a well, a dug well in the center right here. You can see that. I have a pipe that goes underneath the ground and there's a, the, uh, it's right back there. There's a tank that's up high, it's a thousand liter tank. It was a uh, uh, gravity fed water system inside the home. So that worked pretty well. Uh, David, our young son, he was two years old when we went to Thailand here, uh, steering this uh, team of oxen, do we say. Uh, David is now 52 years old, 53 years old, and he's away from the Lord, and I ask you to hold him up in prayer. This is our front porch, and this lady right here, her name is Auntie June. She's holding her daughter, Angie. Uh, that's me there back then. I guess I was about 32 years old at the time. That's our front porch, so you can see it's pretty nice. And there's a tree back there that's all chopped down now. That was a big Akaya tree. It just provided shade for everybody. And in the village, we had a, a store. That's me there going and buying a knife. That's a knife sitting there. There's a store. You see the villagers gang around me. And then Cheryl, she had a ministry with the ladies as well. Uh, this girl here, her husband is a pastor of one of the churches now that we started. Next. 
So here's the dangers we faced in the village life there. This is during the last part of the Vietnamese War. There was a lot of communist infiltration. Uh, it was called the Red Zone on U.S. military maps. Uh, and so the, just across the river, there was a Vietnamese, Vietnamese war going on, but yet we also had communist insurgents on our side. And they buried, many of them, they, they buried sacks of rice in the big jungles up behind us. Uh, so when they took over Thailand, they, uh, this is what their idea was. So it was pretty dangerous. One time we were held by communist soldiers in Laos when we had to go over to do our visa. This is before it actually became communist. And uh, we went across the little town just across the river. And lo and behold, they had leapfrogged up from southern Laos up into that where we were right across from the Kampen home. And uh, it was, uh, they interrogated me for probably two hours or so. Uh, I didn't know the law language very well at that time, but uh, I was able to make out a few things. And the other missionary was with me. They said, well, what are you here for? They said, Manyang, which means, come why? What did you come for? And he said, I guess he, don't, he didn't realize the seriousness. He said, we got kicked out of Thailand. Well, we didn't get kicked out of Thailand, and that set him right on edge, of course. And another thing, well, they finally let us go. And I tell people the story. I say, my boss got a hold of them and said they had to let us go, and they didn't have any choice. They had to let us go. People say, well, who's your boss? I said, well, you probably know his name, the Lord Jesus. <laughs> He's my boss, I tell them. We had Thai bandits in the area. In fact, we heard that they were at, they would camp kidnap businessmen and, and government workers and try to uh, get some ransom. And they had us in their sights, we were told. Uh, and I said, God, please take care of us. That next morning, I heard that the police had had a sting raid on them, ended up killing every last one of the bandits, about 15 or 20 of them. Now, was that coincidence or was that answer to prayer? I believe it was an answer to prayer, obviously. Another thing we have disease, animals, reptiles, snakes, centipedes, coral snakes, uh, tuberculosis, malaria, parasites, that whole town, there was a lot of tuberculosis in the area. Rabbit dogs during dry season would come running in the village all the time. Venomous uh, king cobras. I've, had king, I've eaten king cobra, it's pretty tasty. I'd rather bite on it than have it bite on me, I'll tell you, you know. So, and these centipedes, the centipede right here, they're very dangerous. They, their, their sting is more painful than a scorpion sting. And one of them made up into our house one night. Cheryl got up the next morning to go use the bathroom and she stepped on it. She stepped on its back, it was sitting there. It must have fallen out of the, out of the ceiling or something. She sat there and she stepped, she stepped on it. It didn't hurt her. In fact, she mushed it. Uh, and then there's spiritual warfare. Uh, the enemy targets us. I told uh, Don here a little while ago about this idea where we were so, showing uh, movies in another village nearby and a lightning strike came out of nowhere and uh, hit a tree right beside us. And uh, through power of prompted prayer, we found out later, God had prompted two people, two different people, uh, to pray for our safety. And so we have spiritual warfare. Satan would like to take us out. The more, the more effective you become, the more you become a target. Go ahead. Next. Uh, so cracking the code. If you say Jesus loves you and God dies for your sins, what does that mean to them? They do not share our Western Judeo-Christian worldview. Their response is always, all religions are good, they all teach it to be good. So what you're doing is good. Therefore, they have no concept of a creator God or biblical truth or origins. And they've been taught that Jesus is a religious guru who teaches the Westerners. Now what they actually think of is, when you say Jesus died for your sins, what they, th they think that Jesus had to have died for his own sins because in Buddhist uh, thought, if you die, uh, they call it die home. If you die a horrible, miserable death, like crucifixion, it signifies the fact that you had done some horrible deed in a past life. So Jesus dying for sins, they say Jesus died for his own sins, for something bad he created, or he did, in a past life or past existence. And so the only way past that is to don't start with with the regular Romans road, you have to start with creation. They don't understand creation even though they all love nature. 
Henry Morris said, for one can really understand Jesus Christ as Savior Lord, one must acknowledge him as creator. This is an important doctrine of the New Testament that is remarkable how rarely it's emphasized in modern evangelicalism. And so after years of trial and error, I came up with a very effective little booklet. Go ahead. So, phases of our ministry. The village ministry, then uh, where we saw a church started in the, next, the village next door, uh, moved into town to start the translation process. In the meantime, the church in town was a Christian Missionary Elias church. It was dying on the vine. There was only one family left, and, and the charismatics were circling the wagons. They were, I think they would, they would like to take over anything they can. And so the people in the villages, they looked at the came to the Lord under my ministry, they looked at the church in town as being their their older sister in the Lord. And so I, I couldn't afford to have it uh, go off. So I became the teaching pastor there for about four, four years, five years, until it got back on its feet. And then, uh, so that was that. I translated Genesis and the New Testament, Creation of Evangelism booklet, and uh, now the book is narrated into Northeastern Thai. Go ahead. This is some of the spiritual fruit we've seen. The guy in the top left is our first believer. He became an elder in the local church there. The local church was started by this old couple who came to my house to buy medicine one morning. And I, I have a little stock of medicine there that I got for the people in the villages. They usually have problems of the, like indigestion and things. I said, I've got some more medicine that will clean your heart up so you can go to heaven. And they said, well, bring it on out. Let's take a look. And well, I, I used some different uh, uh, visual aids I had to teach the gospel. And about 1 o'clock that afternoon, they stayed and they listened and listened and listened. They had lunch with us. 1 o'clock that afternoon or so, I said, okay, I've talked to you about everything you need to know. Uh, you need to contact God yourself. Now, their, their hands raised up in a prayer position. They cried out to God for help. Come to find out she was been a chief uh, uh, spirit doctor and they tried to get away from the spirits for years but they didn't know how to do it. People say well make more merit, uh, sell a water buffalo, sell something and give your money to the temple and so on. It never did any good obviously because the temple is in cahoots with Satan. And this is their son, Sama. He went, just went to be with the Lord. His, his name is Sama means steady or always and he was a very steady believer and uh, now this man Possuma, Mr. Possuma, and this is Sama, meaning his name means uh, steady his grand his great grand this man's great granddaughter married some kid who's a man who came to the Lord under my ministry when I was te uh, pack, pe uh, teaching in town and he's a pastor in a church down south of Bangkok. And their son is fifth is a fifth generation Christian from these people right here. Praise the Lord, huh? Amen. Uh, this man, Pitak, he came to the Lord when I was uh, preaching in town and baptized him. And he became the pastor of a church that was started initially by this guy right here. This fellow was a, was a hoodlum, we call him Nuklang. And uh, this is me, this is, t these people, they're all in the ministry now. Jalak, he became a pastor of the church in town, and then he became a Bible translator along with that. And, I, uh, and that's me, of course, uh, back when I was uh, young and vigorous and had a mustache. This man is, uh, he was an army sergeant. He worked with, a, uh, with the Thai army up in the hills to try to keep the, uh, communist insurgents down. This is him now. He's a retired army colonel. This is about the only good picture I had of him. He actually uh, is the lay pastor for this church right here. It started in the village next door. This man right here, as I said, the guy who started the church as this fellow is the pastor of, he was a hoodlum. And now he pastor. He started that church. He also started another church down in southern Thailand. This is he and his wife. And they helped out with the tsunami by a little bit. They got a plaque from the government with all the work that they did in helping the tsunami clean up. Next. I went down there a few months after that. It was horrible. 
This fellow right here, that's Jalak. He's a fellow that uh, became my first Bible translator. He's a missionary and a church planner. This is his wife. She came to the Lord in our ministry. This is Precha. He also, he was a Christian before I met him, but he didn't understand grace. And once he really understood grace, he helped me with translation. He wanted to make sure it was accurate. And uh, he started a church in his own home later on. I think he's of the Lord now. But uh, this fellow here, Pat Tong, he's one of the smartest guys I knew. He helped me with a lot of translation. We're working on Corinthians right here. And uh, unfortunately, he got involved in a, a Korean group that uh, they seem to preach the gospel, but it's a little bit weird. And he's, uh, he's, he delivers Bibles for them, so I don't know what to say. But uh, this is me in Bangkok. Uh, teaching, I was teaching on the four aspects of uh, of uh, salvation, salvation, uh, justification, sanctification, glorification, and these people, about 14 to 15 years later, some of them actually remembered that because it was the word of God, something they never heard before. Many times in in preaching in Thailand, they they just preach on surface stuff, you know, they don't really ground them like we, we try to do. This is my latest. Uh, the fellow I worked with, his name was uh, Bauta. He was a radio announcer. He lost his job because they changed story station format. He became a Christian in 2016. He's got a little house church, but that's pretty well disintegrated now because of the uh, COVID thing. But he's the one that uh, narrated the New Testament into the Isan language. And it's his wife that I asked prayer for. Her name is Ju. She's a uh, Buddhist. And she, when he became a Christian, she walked away from their marriage. But They'd like to get back together again, and she's actually becoming more warm to the gospel. If you get my newsletters, you see I talk about that a lot next. And so these are some of the things we did. This particular book that I showed you, what did I do with it? Here it is. Right here. We printed 33, 34,000 copies of that. This is being printed right there. Uh, a Christian print, a Christian. Christian print shop in Bangkok did that for us, 34,000 copies, and the Considering Creation Evangelistic uh, booklet is in the foreword as well. So, next. This is Isan New Testament, 10,000 of those. Uh, the, the money that was given toward that was a, was a miracle in itself. $25,000 was given toward that to a uh, uh, another ministry called Bearing Precious, Bearing Precious Seed Global, and they got that money and gave it to us toward the, for the printing of the translation. That money came from a little church in Hainan Province, China, and they they raised about twenty three thousand, the total twenty five thousand that uh, went toward the translation. And the girl in that church, out of her life savings, she gave most of the 23000 out of her life savings toward this. Is that humbling? I tell you, it just uh, gives you an appreciation for, for those people. And they're, you know, a lot of them, they don't have a lot of money, but yet they're, just, they're really de dedicated to serving the Lord. So there's what we see right here. This is for people like this, villagers to read the Word of God which they've never heard before in their life. When you, when you read the Word of God to them and they never heard it, they go, ooh, ah, ooh, ah, as the truth of the gospel goes deep into their hearts. They told you that. Next. And this is this little booklet, the Pitzer and Atamacha. It uh, means considering creation. And uh, in that book, we have the different aspects of uh, intelligent design, ending in the idea that there must be an intelligent designer. And this old lady there, she's reading, reading that. And these are some of the things that they say. Wow, where did you get that? That's great. And I have to say, did you read it all? Because if they didn't read it all, they didn't get the gospel. Because the gospel is really heavy duty in the last part. And they say, man, I never thought about it before, but there must be a creator. This is where they have to start to the time because they have no concept of creation. They all love creation. They call it nature, obviously. They don't have the word creation. Uh, you can say it says uh, the things that were created. Uh, and they say, I want to read it again. But I gave it to my wife to read first, or my friend to read. Is that okay, they said? I said, well, sure, it's okay. So 
get a, get a picture of this. Thai Buddhists are evangelizing each other with this little booklet. And we printed, it's, it's kind of disappeared on the bottom of the screen, but we printed 120,000 of those so far. So these are the different pictures up along the top. You can see the different things they talk about. First of all, we started talking about oxygen. You know, how come we don't die? Does the oxygen get all used up? Well, the trees, every leaf on a tree is like a little factory. It produces oxygen from the carbon dioxide. And then I say, what about flowers? We talk about flowers. They're, they're, sometimes they're so real artificial flowers that we can't tell the difference. And we have to uh, maybe touch them or even smell them. Nowadays, they get artificial flowers that are so real you can't tell the difference. But if you took a bouquet of artificial flowers and a bouquet of real flowers side by side and put them in a room and come back a week later, could you tell which ones were real? And they'd say, well, sure, they're dead. i say, that's right. But the artificial flowers were dead in the first place because they never had life. In them. <laughs> they never had life. They say, but then well, where's all where's life from come from? And then how do we know the flowers are pretty? We look at them with our eyes, and we talk about the eye, the miracle of the eye, and so on. And uh, God gave us the eyes not only so we would not stumble, but we'd see all the beautiful creation that He made, you know, and our our, our arms and our uh, skeletal structure, our brain. And then people say we look, we came from monkeys. They say, uh, and it says, uh, my grandfather and grandmother don't look like monkeys. How about yours? That's an insulting thing, you know? We go into detail, like uh, DNA and uh, the Big Bang Theory, and so on. All these things are in this booklet. And they read that, they love it. And there's no Christianese in it whatsoever. It's just the gospel toward the last part. As I say, this is amazing to me. They are passing this thing back and forth. Here it is. What they do with this? Here we go. Pass it back and forth between themselves, evangelizing each other. You got that? Interesting, huh? It's so much of the Lord. Next. So these are some of our accomplishments. Uh, the biggest thing you see in the yellow here. I used to say at one time I said, who would ever want to waste your life doing a foolish thing like that? I was driving my 63 Corvette. I saw somebody working on a Bible translation. It was actually my wife's aunt. She was a translator down in uh, Venezuela. She came home and she was working on a uh, document. I said, well, what's that? She said, oh, that's the Makati Tabi Indian New Testament. We're upgrading it. And I said in my heart of hearts, oh, who'd ever want to waste your life to a foolish thing like that? Guess what I'm doing now? <laughs> <laughs> the greatest job in all the world is to take God's word to those dwelling in spiritual darkness at the uttermost of each end of this earth until the Lord returns. I think everybody, every Christian, not to say, well, I'm a member of a mission-minded church, but every Christian has to have some, in some way, shape, or form, be personally involved in taking the gospel to the ends of the earth. That's the command. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And uh, so that's what we're doing. What happened to me? First, uh, Philippians uh, 2.13 says uh, that God works in us both the will to do of his good pleasure. So there's only two people heard what I said back then. It was me and God. <laughs> I said it under my breath. I didn't say it out loud, obviously. Uh, but that's kind of a personal joke now between the Lord and me. God won. Praise God. <laughs> the greatest thing in all the world is to serve the Lord. You can go on a little further. Okay, now this is the video coming up. It's about... Uh, Five minutes long. First part is about get this thing working. How do I cover it up? Oh, we talk about Buddhism and then about this. This is a seven-headed serpent. This is all part of Buddhism. Uh, and the Bible actually talks about a seven-headed serpent. And they use the same word. That this is the word payanak, which means the the great serpent. And the Bible uses that same term in the Thai Bible. And these people are worshiping Satan and they don't even realize it. Is something, and this is a spirit post. Uh, they'll kill a slave and bury him uh, when they form a city, and a, they'll erect a post over his uh, grave, and then they will go. People will go and they'll take their children and teach them how to pray to the dead spirit. Well, the dead spirit, what, what it actually is, is demons, demonic spirits. That's three aspects of Thai religious life right there. So. If you want to try the next one, we can get this video going.
click it and get it to go. And I'm taking about five seconds to go here. Thanks for listening, by the way. My mouth's so dry, I can't talk straight out. I wasn't even holding the microphone up. Good morning. My name is Ron Myers. I'm a missionary to Thailand along with my wife Cheryl. We've been here for a long time and we've done quite a little bit of study on Buddhism, uh, not book type Buddhism, but just uh, everyday life Buddhism. Uh, first of all, Buddhism was started by a prince in Nepal by the name of Satita Gautama. He got out of the ca castle one day and he had to see all the, all the poor degradation and poverty around him. And he decided he'd try to find a way to cure that. And he tried different things. Uh, he tried asceticism. He tried uh, hedonism. That wasn't working. So he tried what is the middle path. And he came up with eight rules to live by. And so that essentially is what Buddhism is. And when he did that, he, he uh, meditated for quite a while until he, what they called, Dratsaru. Uh, it means he became enlightened. And the word Buddha means the enlightened one. And so now the Thai people, they don't worship Buddha. What they do is they revere Buddha for what he did for them. He found these religious rules for them to live by to be good people. And so that's what Buddhism is, is trying to live good to be a good person. There's nothing wrong with that except uh, Buddha in his uh, enlightenment didn't see any higher than just trying to be a good person. Of course, that's not going to get you to heaven. Uh, they don't think of heaven like we do. They think of nirvana. It's where they want to go after many reincarnations. Uh, they will possibly phase off into another existence called nirvana, which means a lack of being, lack of existence. They uh, melt into a big cosmic gene pool, so there's nothing left to reincarnate. To talking to you now about the second aspect of Buddhism. Uh, behind me, you see a big seven-headed snake called the Payanak. Now, I say this is the second half of the story about Buddhism because this is an integral part of Buddhism that many people don't realize. When Buddha was... Uh, uh, he was meditating in the woods, it started to rain, and this big serpent coiled itself around Buddha and fanned its head out over the top of the Buddha so that he could uh, uh, meditate uh, in peace without having to rain. When he got done meditating and finally became enlightened, the big serpent uncoiled itself and said, May I be a part of your religion? And Buddha said, no, you can't. You're just an animal. And he said, well, uh, can I not have my name as a part of the religion? He, Buddha said, yes, okay. So now everybody who enters Buddhism enters the serpent bond. Now, we need to realize that that's the same word, Hayanak, that's used in the Bible to describe the serpent. And so we see now who they're worshiping. There's just actually worship going on behind me right now. So uh, be praying for these people. Uh, that they will come to understand who they're actually worshiping. They're worshiping Satan. Uh, so thanks for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about Buddhism and Thailand and my work here. We see a lot of people coming to Christ uh, a few at a time. And usually they come because of the they sense the warmth of God, where Buddhism is just a uh, cold, help yourself type of religion. Uh, Christianity, obviously, is uh, God coming down to help us, to save us. Uh, pray for the Thai people. Thank you very much. Two more minutes.
Uh, now, I'm going to give you a little bit different aspect of Thai religious life. This is a uh, spirit post. Uh, it's all buried in with behind all the different flowers and decorations and everything, offerings. Uh, what it is was, uh, it's called animism. Thai doesn't necessarily worship Buddha. They look to Buddha as they, their example of how to be a good person. This is a spirit that they come to, to pray to, to ask for different things. And uh, actually what it started out as, anytime they started a, a village somewhere, they would kill a slave and bury him in a post over the top of the slave dead corpse uh, was where, this, where the dead slave spirit would uh, reside and people would pray to that spirit. This is the same thing, only on a larger scale. They have a big, large one down in Bangkok, so this is part of, uh, as I said, Thai religious life. Thank you. And with that, Buddhism, 94% Muslims, 4% that's in southern Thailand on the Malay border. Uh, full beliefs, about 2% Christians, uh, less than 1%, less than 1%. Like I said, 33,000 villages in Northeast Thailand alone have never been exposed to the gospel. So that's why we went to Northeast. We didn't go to Chiang Mai to enjoy uh, westernized uh, Thai life. We went uh, where the need was the greatest. That's what we're supposed to do as, uh, as missionaries. I'm done. Thank you. Anybody questions? I'm sorry, I didn't hold this up. I got caught on my wrist here. Turn on the light, Ken. I'm sorry, this thing caught on my wrist. Does anybody have any questions? First question is, and when are you going to quit, right? So I'm done now. How's that? I just wanted to give you an opportunity if you had any questions. Take maybe one or two. How many uh, associates do you have working with you? How many what? Associates, Christian uh, people. Right now, I have one. About the the one who was the former radio announcer that did the the sound translation, uh, the audio version of it. He also did the audio versions of this. It's very professionally done. It's in Thai. It's made in northeastern Thai. Can be used all over. The other thing we did, we turned the Thai script into Laotian script because it's a form of Lao. And so, and that along with uh, the audio version can be used by Lao refugees all around the world. So we have a possible potential readership in Northeast Thailand of 28 million, uh, along with uh, probably about 10% of Bangkok, maybe 2 million of in Bangkok, northeastern Thai, and then all the Laos and refugees in Laos and that. We figure all together 35, 40,000 potential readership. So it's, uh, it's God's work. It's, it's just amazing that he's allowed me to be part of it. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, did you find us some heads to Say what? Do they bow to this uh, snake uh, image? Yeah, she toned it way down when she said the last. I didn't hear. Do they bow to it? They, yeah, they bow down to idols. They bow down to. We talk about in the states about well, you know your cars, your idol, whatever. You don't know what an idol is unless you've seen somebody taking their little children to teach them to bow down to a to an actual idol. So, yeah, they, they bow down to it. They're bowing down to Satan. That's what they are doing. Scary, pretty scary. Okay. Five, four, three, two, one. About how many people do you bring to Christianity every year? Turn it up a little, please. About how many people do you bring to Christianity every year? How many, how many come to Christ every year through your ministry? Uh, through my ministry? I couldn't tell you, but quite a few. It's out of my hands now. There are seven or eight churches that were started under my ministry. 
And so I, I essentially mentor and train believer, le, uh, leaders and pastors. That's the way that the Lord worked it out for me. I pastored a Cambodian church here in San Diego for about 15 years as well. So, again. I'm at what? Church. Church? How so, many churches? How many churches? Huh? How many churches did you plant? They were started under my ministry. Not that I personally did it, but people that I trained. Six or seven, I guess. Around Thailand. One minute. Thank you. All right, thank you, Ron. Thank you. Okay. Sorry, I forgot to use the microphone. I hope you all heard me okay. Yeah. All right, now if you could turn to the book of Jude, we're going to sing the last couple of verses, go through a couple times. We are our last family night for 2022. We may be in heaven for 2023, right? Wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, so probably most of you have this memorized by now. Jude verses 24 and 25. Page 1751 if you have the Pew Bible. 1751? 1751, if you have the Pew Bible. Oh. Verses 24 and 25. Alright, everybody ready? Yep. Okay. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and ever. Amen. All right, one more time. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God our Savior be glory and majesty dominion and power both now and ever. Amen. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much, Lord. We take for granted that here we have Bibles, many of us multiple Bibles in our own home, and that we have the Word in our own language, Lord, that we can read and study. And Lord, we just know that, that there are people who haven't even read the Bible, or heard the story of Jesus, Lord, and we're just so thankful, Lord, for such a great salvation, Lord, help us to to be in support of those and fellow laborers with those who are getting out the gospel, Lord, we thank you that, that we can support missionaries in prayer and financially, and Lord, help us to be missionaries wherever we are, that we might be the salt and light, and be ready to give an answer to anyone who would ask of us the reason of the hope that we have with meekness and fear, Lord. Thank you for the opportunities of the CEF booth at the fair and other opportunities you uh, present to us, Lord. And we just pray, help us to be available and usable for you, Lord, that we would be focused on Christ and not be distracted by the things of this world. And that you would just uh, help us to acknowledge you in all of our ways and you direct our paths. And we thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, for all of you between 4 and 104, including Jean, and still have a little energy left in yourselves. We're going to do three legged races. <laughs> so come over on the grass.